criminal justice counseling. That's what we're going to transition to. This is the whole class is counseling. And more specifically, uh, counseling in the realm of corrections, which is why we have the correctional counseling. Uh, we're going to talk about a little today uh, about the role of a corrections counselor, why we have them, how they differ from some of the other jobs, things like that. Uh, first thing is just kind of give us a, a, a definition. We need to, to figure out what it is that, that they do and why they are needed. Uh, I'll open it up. What, what, what do you guys think? What, why would we put somebody in a counseling role in a correctional role? You know, before you said, let's back up even further. What is a correctional role? What, what is corrections? How would we define that? Incarceration. That's absolutely part of it. Incarceration, corrections. We, we talk about uh, North Carolina Department of Corrections, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. They expanded their name. They used to be just the California Department of Corrections, but they expanded the name to DOC and Corrections. Or to DOC and Rehabilitation. So it could be more than just incarceration, but that is an absolutely probably the largest aspect of corrections is some sort of incarceration. So we have uh we have different levels of incarceration, right? We have jails, prisons. But what else? What outside of incarceration? I know we talked about some some other classes. What about after prison? If you get out of prison early, do you get to you get to go scot free, or do you have some rules if you get out of prison early? Parole. Parole, right? So you might get out of prison three years early, but you still have rules. So parole, briefly, is essentially still being in prison without the bars. I know it sounds funny. It sounds like a very strange way of describing it, but let me expound on it a little bit. What are some of the things that you can't do in prison? What, what liberties have you, do you lose in prison? Oh, I'll take your hand up. Okay. Can't smoke. What else? Cell phone. No cell phone, right? Uh, you got to be in bed at a certain time, or at least be in your cell. Liberties you lose again. Is it also being on the internet? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I I know there has been some looseness. With the internet, because so much is on the internet nowadays, and, and, and schools and things like that could be online. I'm sure there are restrictions to online, but I'm not positive there's a 100% uh, banning of internet access to prisoners as we as currently get. Yeah. So, anything that's still with outside rules for them? Hey, that's a really good. That's a really good way to put it. He said anything that deals with the outside. That's that's good. So, if we're gonna parole. So, and then quickly a definition of parole, you know, you, you get out, you've done a, a percentage of your time and you think you, you've rehabilitated, but you're not going to be let off scot-free. We'll let you out three years early, but you're on parole. You're not a free person. You're not a free man or free woman. How do we, what's the difference between being free and somebody on parole then? It would be the, the question. So we said in prison, you can't be on your cell phone. You have to be in bed at a certain time. You got to be in your cell at a certain time. You have certain uh, restrictions given to you when you're in jail. And I told you that being in on parole is like being in prison, except without the bars. So let's look at some of those parole restrictions. Things like you gotta be home at a certain time because you're on parole. Me, Steven, do I have to be home at a certain time? No, I'm not on parole. I can be out all night if I want it. I could, I could be like Lionel Richie all night long. But if I'm on parole, then I have a rule that says, oh, I got to be home at whatever time, 10 o'clock. Uh, maybe smoking, absolutely drinking, drugs, things like that. There are restrictions. If you're on parole, you, they can absolutely tell you no drinking. Drinking is legal. I can drink. There's, there's no law that says I can't drink. We have the liberties to, to drink alcohol over a age. But if you're on parole, we can take those liberties away because it's like being in prison. Without the bars, where you go, you can give you can have restrictions on you can't go to somebody's house, especially if uh, if you have a victim of a crime, a specific victim of a crime, you'd be told you can't go anywhere near their house, like restraining you. So those are the types of correctional uh, environments that are different than being incarcerated. Uh, we have different reasons why we incarcerate folks. 
but essentially we want to change behavior. That, that's the, the main goal of any kind of punishment. The main goal of any kind of punishment is to change behavior through a series of different. Well, I'm going to the we have, we have at least five. Uh, different rationale for, for why we punish folks, but uh, I won't get too deep into that right now. But the, the main overarching theme of why we punish is because we want to change behavior. That's how you get it. Okay. Yeah. Did you turn your wrist just the right way? Apparently. She, uh, she's, she's, she's trying to get on my right. She's trying to get on my good side. She didn't say it was a, it was a bad question. Um, Y'all should take some notes. So, uh, but I will say that that is a very key thing for you to remember. I would probably write it down if I were you. Is the idea that the goal of punishment, the goal of corrections, is to change behavior, regardless of, of, of how we do it. It's the same thing as punishment when it comes to any of us, whether it comes to a child. Obviously, we're not going to. We don't necessarily incarcerate our children. But I would say, I would venture to say that grounding a child is a lot like incarcerating them. It's, it's similar. You're taking away their liberties, right? Putting a, a child in timeout is taking away their liberties. So that's similar to incarceration. But there's a ton of, what are some other things you could do to discipline a child? Absolute corporal punishment, physical punishment, a spanking. Did I hear something over here? Timeout. Timeout. Yeah, exactly. What is what does a timeout do? Why, why does that change behavior? Makes them think of what happened and why it happened. Yeah. And what they could have done better. Timeout, whether you put your nose in the corner or sit in the chair, whatever your version of a timeout is, is that fun for a child? No. I would I would imagine it's not. And so because you've exchanged something that is not pleasant. Or something you don't want them to do, you want them to make a choice later in life or later in the day. Okay, I don't want to do that because when I did, I got this. So you change that behavior. Uh, same thing with corporal punishment, physical punishment. The idea it is not pleasant to receive pain. So to in order to avoid that pain, we're going to change our behavior and make a choice to not do whatever it is that caused that pain to, to come. Uh, there are a couple of the uh, themes of punishment, the uh, rationale for punishment that I do want to touch on. I don't want to touch on, on all of them. Uh, I did talk about grounding a child. Grounding a child is kind of like putting them in a, in a mini version of, of jail, right? Can we, can we say there's a, a similarity between grounding and uh, imprisonment, incarceration? It's, you're putting them, they can't, can't do anything wrong. Uh, obviously a junior varsity version. Why, why is jail a viable option for punishment? What is it about jail that prevents crime. What do you, I'll, I'll start with you on the side. What, what, do you, what do you think? What is it about going to jail or prison? Like going to a cell. What is it about going to a cell that helps prevent crime? The like not wanting to, like not wanting that. Sure. Or being locked away. Like tell me more. Yeah. Like, it stinks. Like it's just, it's not, it's like the timeout we talked about. It's, it's a, it's a grown-up timeout, right? I mean, we could call that a grown-up timeout. What else? What you, why, why does going to jail stop somebody from breaking law? Um, or prison. I'm just like a jail cell. I'm sorry. Literally, instead of probation or parole, why is being in that facility stop? Right. You couldn't be alone. Oh. Alone. I like that. You said you didn't have to because you're alone. In general, it, it kind of stinks to be alone, right? We are social creatures. Sometimes we want to be alone, but I don't think we ever want to be forced to be alone. Whether it's in a relationship, the end of a relationship where you're forced to be without your significant other, or a death in the family where you're forced 
to not have that interaction anymore. These times where you're alone and didn't want it are far worse than if you chose to. One, I think, I mean, when we choose to be alone, temporary, right? Like very few times outside of, you know, like a hermit type of a decision where you're just gonna live on top of a mountain by yourself. Uh, just you, your land and your shotgun. Very, very few times is that is that a long-term decision. Usually when folks are alone, it's uh, it's either temporary or, or not by choice. So I, I like that that's, a, that's an interesting concept. Uh, come on, what, what do you think? You're just living your freedom. Yeah, we, I mean, our country specifically, but, uh, but people in general are very uh, beholden to their freedoms. I mean, our, our country is built on specific freedoms and the ability to fight for those freedoms. And we take them very, very seriously. And having those taken away from you uh, from a legal or authoritarian standpoint has got to be uh, painful, uh, you know, not physically painful, but emotionally painful to, to lose those freedoms. So yeah, I can see that. Um, but also, th those are the reasons that would help somebody make that decision in the future. Uh, there was, there's a, there's a, I talked about making a choice earlier and, and real briefly, there's, there's an idea that folks, if you give somebody enough of a negative reinforcement, then they will choose not to do whatever it is that you're doing. Some theorists uh, have, have come up with that idea that folks will make a, a rational choice. Uh, that I don't want the timeout. I don't want the grounding. I don't want the spanking. I don't want to be in a jail cell. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to lose my freedoms. All those things are going to incorporate into a decision and say, okay, well, whatever it was that caused me to do that, I'm not going to do that. So you guys are absolutely correct that that is why incarceration specifically or any punishment will aid in preventing crime. But specifically when it comes to incarceration, and we can extend it to the uh, analogy that I use grounding, even timeout. The adult, could we call jail like an adult timeout a, a couple minutes ago. The idea that once you are in jail, that crime is going to be lessened outside. But in this case, specifically during the time that you're in jail, not, not later, not after you're released and you think, oh, I don't want to go back to jail. So we have a term called incapacitation. Where if you're in jail, society has said, like, oh, well, if we put them in this room, this jail cell, then everybody who's outside that room is safe from crime. Incapacitation. It's in chapter one of your book, and I probably write it down for you. Write down that you want to research and get a really good definition of incapacitation. And a general definition of that is what I just said. The, the idea that society has determined that you can't follow the rules. So we're going to put you someplace where society doesn't have to worry about you. Um, so the three of you specifically that, that just joined in, in that conversation. You see the difference in, in how we described at the beginning where you know, I don't want to lose my freedoms. I don't want to be alone, and I don't want to uh, just be where I don't want to be. That doesn't necessarily incorporate inca the theory of incapacitation because those are all going to be uh, taken into account once I get out, and I don't want to come back. Incapacitation specifically is talking about the time while you are currently incarcerated. However. The other, while well, well, we have our notes out, the other term I want you to research is rehabilitation. Of all the theories of punishment, those two, incapacitation and rehabilitation for chapter one, uh, I want you to, to put some focus in, into getting definitions for. Rehabilitation, uh, we'll, we'll go over here and we'll keep, you looked out in the middle when we start on this side again. Uh, Ms. Pendergraft, tell me in your own words about rehabilitation. You said treatment program? Yeah, there we go. Uh, and you said ra rather than going to, to jail, but I think we could also do it while in jail too. We could have some uh, some programs in jail. I bet maybe correctional counseling. 
if we were to bring it all back, correctional counseling might be something that would aid in rehabilitation versus just that incapacitation, like lock them up and throw away the key. Uh, Mr. Ford, what, what do you have to add on uh, rehabilitation in your, in your own words? What are some of the, you could, what are some programs? We have we, in, in jails, we have different different classes and and skills that we could teach uh, inmates. Have you have you put any thought into what kind of what kind of classes and skills that inmates could learn to help keep them out of jail later? You can follow a friend if you want. A drug classes, alcohol yeah. classes. Classes that would help to better them post release, post parole, that they could use to get a degree or something like that to get a job afterwards, which would in turn hopefully keep them out of that, that, that sort of lifestyle. Which kind of goes along with what you guys are saying. That you see, if you combine those, the ability, so the desire to make a good decision, right? If, if, if you don't want to be alone, you don't want to. To, to be in jail and you don't want to lose your freedoms. You, and now you have that desire to not lose those things. But do you have the ability? Do you have the skill sets to not? If all you know is crime, or if you grew up, if you grew up in a uh, uh, a neighborhood where you didn't have the mentoring and the ability, or even the finances to have these skill sets, a college degree or a skill, uh, a learned trade, you have that desire, but you don't have the skill. Then rehabilitation could represent an opportunity. To get those skills. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they, they're religious. I mean, in, in a lot of situations, the idea of uh, looking to a deity or looking to religion when you're in a, in a real pickle, when you're in a real tough spot, is absolutely very, very common. We see a lot of folks uh, when they're going through just not even legal problems, just personal problems. You know, divorces, breakups, loss in the family that people will turn to church because that that strength from from a deity helps them. So I would imagine I think we could throw in incarceration or, or being being punished or getting going to jail or going to prison is probably going to be classified as a, as a tough time. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've never been to prison. Uh, well, I've, I've never been to prison and not been to leave. I've been to jail and prison several times, but I just go in, do my business and come out. Uh, the the idea of looking at a, a deity is absolutely a, a good example of these programs that Ms. Cunningham was, was talking about. The idea of being able to give them some resources, <clears throat> and then we bring it back to the counseling. A lot of counseling is religious based. We're not going to talk about too much of this not a religious class, but in general, there are a lot of religious counselors. There's a lot of uh, ministers and things like that will, that will provide counseling to a ton of folks. It doesn't have to be incarcerated individuals. But the idea of providing counseling and mental health aid and mental health services to folks, the whole point of it is, the whole point of counseling, especially in a correctional uh, environment, is to prevent future criminal behavior. And are we doing that? Because we're providing the skill sets to do that. Part of that skill set is mental health counseling. Uh, it was a definition I wanted to make sure you guys highlighted. There we go. So page four, what is correctional counseling? One thing I want you guys to, uh, to take a look at, how we define it. We, we define correctional counseling as planned interaction between correctional workers uh, and a whole ton of other, uh, other folks. And it's going to be between them and probationers, prisoners, and parolees with the aim of changing a pattern of the recipient's behavior toward conformity to social expectations. It goes back to what we were saying at the beginning. Highlight that, please. Uh, it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning. The idea that the whole point of punishment and then thereby the rehabilitation portion of or aspect of, of punishment is to change the behavior. In this case, you're changing behavior to get more to the societal norms that have been set. Us as a society, we have determined that people have to act a certain way. And if you don't act a certain way, the bad things are going to happen to you. Fines, incarceration, probation, things like that. So correctional counseling is going to be an interaction between 
a counseling professional, which could be a licensed therapist, or it could be a police officer, it could be a correctional uh, officer, a custodial officer, any, any of those can act in a, a counseling role temporarily. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a licensed therapist by any means. And that's not what you're going to be at the end of this class. This is not a class to, uh, to license you to be a mental health professional. What it is, is that these counseling aspects, these, these roles that these, these authority figures play, all ball together and become a form of counseling for the inmates, providing them with, with the interaction that will eventually change their behavior and more conform with our societal norms. In this case, our societal norms, if you violate them, are a violation of the law. But there are a ton of other things that society says this is how we should act that aren't against the law. Uh, society has said that if we start at 1230, then you should be here at 1230. That's what society said. Now, if you're not, you're not going to go to jail. There, it, there are violations of norms that are not violations of law. It's just, you, you just didn't, you didn't do what society generally expects. Um, and societal expectations and laws change. I was going to use the example of nudity. Society expects that when you show up to class at 12.30, not only are you on time, but you're wearing clothes. Now, in some jurisdictions, that's also a violation of the law, but in others, it's not. Take, uh, most recently, <clears throat> San Francisco has had some, some protests wherein uh, public nudity, the, the law against public nudity is being challenged, and folks are protesting in the nude. Society it, and you know perhaps the law is changing, it's conforming to different norms. Norms, societal norms change, they amend. And they could be in different norms for different areas. Certain areas are more conservative, certain areas are more liberal. Historically, San Francisco is is more liberal than, than say Johnston County. Yes. So is that the reason why the phrase laws are dead and humans are alive? Is it? Uh, I, to be honest, I don't think I've ever heard that term. Laws are dead and humans are alive. Well, what's the context for that? I'm curious. Laws can be changed, but humans change them. Right, because so it takes no, a human. There's no one human. Yeah, society as a whole. We talked about, uh, three of my classes this morning, we talked about representation and, and making laws and policies based on an entire group of people. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're right. When it comes to, uh, changing laws they could easily they somewhat easily be changed as society uh, conforms to different norms so nudity being being one of them uh, another really common one i think uh, more recently is uh, the use of cannabis marijuana it was totally taboo several years ago whereas now not only has it uh, you know it progressed to being legalized for medicinal purposes and then in a lot of jurisdictions being legalized for just recreational purposes. Uh, I, I don't believe North Carolina has, has gotten there as of yet, but uh, California has. And several other states have, have taken away, at least lessened, if not uh, removed penalties for use of cannabis. That is just a <coughs> society has changed its norms and those are the norms we talk about when in the correctional counseling that the goal is to make sure people are conforming to the norms those norms are going to be changing uh drug use in general what used to put people in prison later started putting people only in jail and then later started putting people only on probation and in some cases some jurisdictions have removed all penalties altogether marijuana was, was one of them but even harder drugs cocaine heroin methamphetamine things like that there are jurisdictions wherein uh those, those hard drugs used to be a, a, a felony. Some jurisdictions moved, have made them misdemeanors. And some, uh, I believe, I don't know about all of Washington State, but Seattle, one of those jurisdictions thereabouts has, has gone to no penalty for those. So the idea that what used to be a felony in some jurisdictions, which meant prison time, to no penalty at all is, is a huge uh, transition 
in societal norms. That's over. 115, right? Or 145, right? Is there anything else I want to touch on? I'm going to let you go. Okay, do me a favor. When, uh, obviously, I want you to, to read the whole chapter, but I do want you to focus on a couple things in your reading and, uh, and do some highlighting. Uh, call some insight from a guy who, uh, who knows a guy who wrote the test. Uh, page 11, the personal qualities of an effective counselor. Please pay close attention to that. Page 7, about the middle of the page, we talk about what happens when <clears throat> correctional counseling goes, uh, goes awry. The idea of liability, one, I want you to pay close attention to exactly what liability is definitionally and what causes that type of liability in a correctional counseling setting. Any questions on what we've discussed thus far today? 